There is a maze in the desert, carved from sand and rock. A vast labyrinth of pathways and corridors, a hundred miles long, a thousand miles wide, full of twists and dead ends. Picture it, a puzzle you walk, and at the end of this maze is a prize just waiting to be discovered. All you have to do is find your way through. Can you see the maze? Its walls and floors, its twists and turns? Good. Because the maze you've created in your mind is itself the maze. There is no desert, no rock or sand. There is only the idea of it. But it's an idea that will come to dominate your every waking and sleeping moment. You are inside the maze now. You cannot escape. Welcome to Madness. Happy hair season. Welcome to the desert of the real. And welcome to Madness. Sorry. Wish I had better news. We're all mad here, you see. All of humanity. All of humanity trapped in a maze of the mind, partly of our own making, and partly because of omnipotent mind parasites known as Archons, Wetico, or the Predators of Castañeda. We're trapped, disconnected from a greater reality, from our true selves. What truth? That you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch. A prison for your mind. Sorry, I don't make the rules, but I do break them, and I think you do too. For that's why you have arrived at the virtual Alexandria. We're getting out of this maze. We're losing our mind and coming to our senses. But it's hard, even as we continue to run with those searching for the truth and avoiding those who have found it. As Philip K. Dick wrote, The maze shifts as you move through it, because it is alive. They built their own prison, and so they exist in a state of schizophrenia, where they are both guards and prisoners, and as a result they no longer have, having been lobotomized, the capacity to leave the prison they've made, or to even see it. As a prison. So how do you get out, Miguel, you Gorgon ass and Odin Dingleberry? Well, the answer is here, everywhere. Let's look at the myth of Theseus. The Minotaur in the maze wasn't just some game boss, but symbolized Theseus' own distorted ego, his every negative emotion and festering sin and ugly impulse. The Minotaur was a mirror, a glass darkly no more. In other words, each one of us has to confront our demons, the trauma of our past, both those who raped us and all our victims, and light the fuckers up in ecstasy, embrace them until our hands bleed with the nails of our disassociation and integrate them with love within our souls. And the book says we may be through with the past, but the past ain't through with us. That's what the ancient Gnostics and other mystery religion practitioners did. That's what I'm starting to do with finding Hermes. That's what you must do. It's brutal and it's painful, but it's the first step to getting out of the maze. And remember, in the myth, youth and virgins are sacrificed to the Minotaur, which represent our innocence held hostage by our ego. Theseus leads the youths and virgins out of the labyrinth, which means that when we face war, we don't lose our innocence, but our ignorance. If it can be destroyed by the truth, it deserves to be destroyed by the truth. And the golden thread Theseus used is from Princess Ariadne, but you can call her Sophia. Lady Wisdom planted it deep within your psyche aeons before you were born to help you out. 
The thread is Gnosis, leading you back to your original and authentic self, out of madness and into the oceans of possibility. As Plato said, all learning is remembering. To say yes to one instant is to say yes to all of existence. You face your demons, you follow the cord, and now as you leave the labyrinth of your mind, you, well, what do you do next? Theseus sailed back home and went from nothing to a king. He became resurrected, you see, into a new being in this world, in his own adventure. That's what we'll be discussing in this eternal now, my beloved true seekers. A resurrection. Or actually the book, The Lost Art of Resurrection, by the sapient and bright Freddy Silva. An overdue interview with an individual who gets the Gnostics and other nuclear mystics and daring mystagogues. Freddy's ideas are more important than ever in these Gnostic times as most of humanity wanders in their mazes, gored by their egos and buggering their innocence. Everybody just yells and screams at each other. Nobody's civil anymore. Nobody thinks what it's like to be the other guy. Alas, we could only do an hour, even if we covered so much labyrinth ground. Scheduling issues and Freddy was dealing with serious cyber attack issues on his internet domains. So as a bonus, we were honored to also have my friend and a brilliant scholar, Joanna Kuyawa, for patrons and AV Prime members. She'll compliment what Freddy doesn't fully cover, even in his book specifically the rich and mercurial tradition of the dying and rising goddess. Chthonic deities like Inanna, Isis, and Ishtar that will fuck any demiurge up real horror show. There is a reason Sophia is called the Queen of Hades in the Gospel of the Egyptians, or the death-loving Akamoth, or Mother of Demons. She tore a hole in our universe, a gateway to another dimension, the dimension of pure chaos. But yes, you must face the Minotaur, and you must resurrect as you hold on to Gnosis and those oceans of possibility. As the Gospel of Philip says, While we are in the world, it would be right to attain resurrection, so that, free of the flesh, we know tranquility, and do not become wanderers in the intermediate world. Many get lost on the way. It is good to awaken from the world going astray there. In another section, the Gospel of Philip says, Anyone who believes in resurrection as a literal truth is a fool. Those who say they die first then rise are in error. They must receive the resurrection while they love. You must awaken while in this body, for everything exists in it. Life will not be contained. Life breaks free, it expands to new territories, and it crashes through barriers painfully, maybe even dangerously, but life uh, finds a way. Oh, Miguel, you and your silly stories and trippy myth-making. How does this all lead to resurrection, some of you may ask? Well. The Gospel of Philip also states what I feel is one of the great passages on Gnosis. It goes, Truth did not come into the world naked, but veiled with images and archetypes. Otherwise it cannot be received. There is rebirth through the image of rebirth. One must truly be reborn from this image. This is resurrection. In other words, write your own gospel and live your own myth. You need to believe in things that aren't true. How else can they become? How you resurrect is up to you. But as I mentioned, part of the work on finding Hermes will give you the way the Gnostics did it in ancient times. For me, I face pure horror, 
that mirror or minotaur during ayahuasca ceremonies, doing the fourth step in AA, breaking ground with my therapist, praying after taking the host, in dreams and long meditations, and in so many other settings where I see the labyrinth for what it is. Grid is live. Initiate light cycle battle. The key is that I had that golden thread from Sophia, manifesting in wise teachers and comforting egregores and summon daemons. So I suggest you do the same. Don't waste another social media post, another Amazon order, another fight with your significant other. Know you're in a maze and know you can get out and meet your authentic self. Even if the demiurge attempts to put you right back in. After all, in some stories, Theseus dumps Ariadne as soon as he's resurrected in the oceans of possibility and pays for it dearly. Just when I thought I was out, they pull me back in. But enough of my dribble. Let us do the interview with Freddy Silva and then Joanna Cuyawa. Keep in mind that Finding Hermes is officially out, as I mentioned as well as the merch store that has some humorous nipples for men and birdie num num products. Audience demand, you know? Keep in mind too, that if you need any voiceover for books or anything else, I'm available. It's 2020, so I'm putting all my cards on the table, being transparent to the transcendent. And I hope you are too as you face your minotaurs and resurrect. Never losing your innocence, but only your ignorance. Oh, Miguel, these ancient stories are not relevant. Get with the times. All right, how about something more modern on the maze you're in right now? How about this clip from Black Mirror? People think there's one reality, but there's loads of them all snaking off like roots, and what we do on one path affects what happens on other paths. Time is a construct. People think you can't go back and change things, but you can. That's what flashbacks are. They're invitations to go back and make different choices. When you make a decision, you think it's you doing it, but it's not. It's the spirit out there that's connected to our world that decides what we do, and we just have to go along for the ride. Mirrors let you move through time. The government monitors people. They pay people to pretend to be your relatives. And they put drugs in your food. And they film you. There's messages in every game. Like Pac-Man. Do you know what Pac stands for? P-A-C. Program and Control. He's Program and Control Man. The whole thing's a metaphor. He thinks he's got free will, but really, he's trapped in a maze, in a system. All he can do is consume. He's pursued by demons that are probably just in his own head. And even if he does manage to escape by slipping out one side of the maze, what happens? He comes right back in the other side. People think it's a happy game. It's not a happy game. It's a fucking nightmare world. And the worst thing is, it's real and we live in it. It's all code. If you listen closely, you can hear the numbers. There's a cosmic flowchart that dictates where you can and where you can't go. I've given you the knowledge. I've set you free. Do you understand? Maybe. Yes. So... I'll show you what I mean. Come with me. This is the A on Byte interview. And with us, we have the pleasure of being joined by Freddy Silva to discuss his book, The Lost Art of Resurrection, Initiation, Secret Chambers, and the Quest for the Other World. Freddie, thank you very much for coming on the show. Oh, pleasure, Miguel. And as uh, we talked, I really enjoyed your book. It is definitely something that will interest our audience very much. Oh, good. But, yes, indeed, uh, especially the <laughs> subjects which we shall delve into. But with us, too, we've got the Moondog Vance. Vance, how are you doing? I'm fine on this wonderful sunny day. 
out here in California, looking forward to learning these secrets of the afterlife. There you go. The of course, if I tell you, I'd have to kill you. <laughs> well, then I'll know again for sure. Okay. Right? Yeah, 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 right right back. <laughs> Why are you back on earth again? Because you killed me. Oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> That's very cool. So, Freddie, maybe briefly, could you tell the audience the thesis of your book? Yeah, I was, um, I was looking into the origin of sacred sites around the world, specifically megalithic structures, and there was a few of them that didn't seem to fit the bill. I kept coming across... Um, temples that where people were mentioned to have died yet they came back to tell the tale I thought that's unusual and uh, it, there were all these side notes that I gathered for years and then one day I sat down with more than five minutes on my hands and I figured you know this would make a really good research project and I kept pushing it and uh, lo and behold the gods put books in front of me um, recently translated by a, a couple of Danish gentlemen who were looking at the pyramid texts, which were uh, this wonderful Neolithic wallpaper that's painted on the underground chamber of uh, the Pyramid of Unas in Egypt. And they're talking about how there, these are the instructions for a pharaoh who is meant to go to the other world alive and return. And he's expected to come back and fulfill his duty, his everyday duties. And I thought, what a great subject. And it turns out that there was a secret initiation, uh, the most secret of all initiations, and it spanned the world over. Uh, even in North America, the native people were also practicing this uh, ceremony as far as 1890 around the Great Lakes. And it really concerned the idea that you joined a kind of secret society uh, and nothing nefarious about it. Uh, they were just protecting some very careful secrets. They didn't want the information to fall into the wrong hands. And it was a, a very dangerous procedure whereby you were given a, kind of an induced near-death experience and you went walk about in the other world as easily and as realistically as you and I go shopping for vegetables. And um, you came back with your eyes completely opened about the mysteries of life, the true origin of the universe, and more importantly, about the nature of your soul. And no wonder people queued up to have this very dangerous procedure. And essentially that was the nuts and bolts of what the book was about. It was about tracing how far back and how prevalent this initiation was. And it turns out it spanned the world and I've traced it back to Japan in 8,000 BC. And eventually, this practice moved west, and it became the foundation of the way that was practiced by the Essenes. And one particular interesting gentleman called Yeshua ben Yosef, otherwise known as Jesus Christ. So it does open up the story considerably. Oh, yes, indeed. It's quite a journey. And so you would say 8000 BC is the first time that we have this historical record of the art of resurrection? It's alluded to in a text from Japan called the Kujiki 72, um, and it was recently translated, uh, ironically, by this, uh, an author who's also on the same roster as my publisher. And um, I was reading through it, and there were a lot of techniques. In fact, virtually all the techniques that they were describing here were similar, if not identical, to the practices of the Essenes and the people that were practicing the way uh, in the uh, Near East around Jesus' time. And uh, it turns out that when you look at the origin of the name of these 17 practices, um, that are called the Tayyi, it literally translates as the way. So there were 17 ways or practices that you had to learn before you were allowed anywhere near a kind of sarcophagus or a, a sacred cave where you would have this induced out-of-body experience. So there's a lot of alluding to it. They don't give away the practice, as, as always. It was, a, it was a very well-kept secret. And uh, when you correspond that to what the Greeks had learned in their time and overlap what they knew, then it seems to be the oldest known uh, time when this, uh, these teachings were actually written down. Very interesting. And yes, your book uh, talks a lot about uh, the Egyptians and how they saw the world, as you say, they believed in as above, so below. And isn't it important to really try to understand the Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians, because people assume that they were obsessed with death, but I think what they were obsessed with was eternity. Earth was simply a springboard into the greater life. And as you write, uh, this springboard the, to go into the Amdwab was to, quote, awaken the inner human being. So they really were understanding about becoming divine while on earth. 
They really did. And uh, I, th I was looking at the situation from the point of view of when this concept of the uh, infatuation between the Egyptians and the dead came about. And it really came about as an opinion by archaeologists in the Victorian era, most of them from England, uh, who just jumped to this conclusion because they kept seeing mummies and mummified bodies. And because we had also recently been practicing uh, this uh, concept of honoring the dead by putting people in coffins, they put one and one together and just took it very literally. But uh, in any ancient teaching, the teachings are not literal. They are metaphoric and they're allegorical. And that's where they, um, their, uh, their theory, or at least their opinions, became accepted as fact. And no one questioned it for at least 100 years. And it's only recently that people have been looking at the ancient teachings from Egypt and saying, well, wait a minute, there is there are veiled uh, things here that we should be looking at because that's how they spoke. There was an everyday language for ordinary people and uh, for despots, but for people who were practicing a spiritual tradition, there was metaphor. And uh, I mean, Jesus was particularly good at this. If you read some of the things that he was saying in the Bible, which make absolutely no sense from a, <laughs> yeah. a, a literal point of view, but when you understand the mechanisms and the theatrical devices that they employed, to keep this information from being misused, it makes a lot of sense. And that's where this concept of uh, unlocking the pyramid text and begin to read into it, <coughs> excuse me, um, it, became, it made more sense because if, you, it, if you're giving people the instructions to a guy who's dead, uh, I remember one particular uh, uh, situation in Saqqara where the pharaoh had to give this public performance on his, the 13th year of his reign. He would literally run an, uh, the entire perimeter of the Temple of Saqqara, which is about a kilometer. I mean, he had to you know, do some pretty fast running. And people would look at the pharaoh and say, this guy is fit to rule. And they clapped and they went home. And then he was set aside to a smaller courtyard where he were, it was a private ceremony where I, I was reading about this and it said that the pharaoh was given a morning meal, a midday meal, and an evening meal. And I'm looking at this from two points of view. If I'm looking at this literally, I'm thinking, well, if the guy's dead and is going into the other world, <laughs> which is what you expect, why are they feeding a corpse? It doesn't make any sense. Unless, of course, you start reading into it and you realize, well, wait a minute, he's not going to die physically, he's going to die metaphorically. And they're, what they're giving him is a poison. They're slowly loading up his body with a poison to the point where by the time he takes his evening meal, he's pretty much out of it. And then they put him in a uh, sarcophagus, which was specially carved for the occasion, in a special room, and uh, he would disappear. And three days later, he literally is risen from the dead. And the first thing that uh, he sees when he's taken to the mound, uh, and women did this as well, by the way, um, he goes on a sacred mound and he is shown Venus rising before the equinox sunrise, which is always, wherever you go around the world, that's the mark of the risen initiate. And the Greeks followed on from this tradition because they learned their traditions from the Egyptians and they called it the uh, living resurrection. Uh, and that's actually noted down. So it suddenly put a whole different twist on the concept of what resurrection really was about. It was a, a spiritual awakening and that, and that's when it made a lot of sense about the hieroglyphs telling us that, yes, the Pharaoh is supposed to go through this crazy process of going into the other world, but then he's supposed to, he's expected to come back into his body and carry on f until he has a physical death. And suddenly the story made a lot of sense. Really fascinating. And it, it does make sense, of course, uh, as we know, the Greeks certainly borrowed, as you just mentioned, from the Egyptians. Uh, Plato, Pythagoras, all these cats were initiated in Egypt because they had the mystic uh, dope, if you would. And even <laughs> Socrates, he himself, didn't Socrates say that the purpose of life is to die while living? Exactly. Yeah, the purpose of the philosopher is to die uh, while uh, living or it's something to that, to that effect. It was a wonderful quote, or he seeks death above, above life. And, and Plato himself said that uh, his initiation to the living resurrection shaped and molded his metaphysical doctrine and actually got him to do the things that he did and he's known for. And Pythagoras was just a junkie for this stuff. He did it five times times wow. he couldn't get enough of the afterlife while he was alive and he'd come back and he'd he'd want to talk about it but of course he couldn't because you're under pain of death and the, uh, back in the days if you went to the taverna after your initiation and sat there having uh, some retina with your friend they'll say <laughs> well what did you do the weekend pythagoras and well I, 
if he talked about his experience, he would be put in jail. It was an uh, actual criminal offense. And it turns out it wasn't because so, he was so much betraying a, the inner secret of the inner temple, which he was. It's a fact that if you were to share your experience of your soul in the other world, it would cloud the experience and the expectation of the person that's coming after you. Because your, you, your soul is unique. You are an, an individual being. And for you to suddenly tell somebody else, well, this is what happened to me. Well, if you're going to go and follow in his footsteps, you're going to expect that to happen to you. And of course, it's not because you are following a very, very different road. And that's uh, the reason why it was forbidden to discuss your experience. So you wouldn't cloud someone else's judgment. So they were very serious and very adamant about uh, protecting these secrets. That makes perfect sense why they would keep it secret. And uh, obviously our show deals heavily with the Gnostics and the Hermetics. And I must admit, Freddie, I thought your chapter was the coolest name chapter in the world. Fifty Shades of Gnosticism. Love it. <laughs> you can, you, you, I think you can pretty much understand around which time I wrote that when another best-selling <laughs> book of a similar title came out. And I was making fun of the situation. <laughs> Of course, no. they, that one sold 100 million copies and mine didn't, but never mind. Yeah, I think people would rather have sex than go to the astral world. I disagree. I disagree. I want to take those flights, but... Uh, well, exactly. I mean, it's because uh, you come back with your eyes open. You see the world with very different eyes, and you begin to see the world and how it's all and its perspectives. You are of the world, but you... Well, well, actually, I should say you're in the world, but you're not of the world. There's almost like a thin layer of glass between you and life, and you, you're able to see things from the bigger picture, from the big perspective, and that means you have control over your life. You have a certain degree of control of the laws of nature, which is one reason why a lot of people really wanted to get their hands on this information and do some very stupid things with it. But it was the idea that you have a, a definite level of control while you're in the body. So you're making the most of your car, incarnation. You've got about 80 years in which to do something important here. And if you can do it with your eyes open, well, that gives you a certain advantage. It means you are in control to a certain degree of your destiny that you chose. And there are still things you can't control, of course, because they're deliberately hidden from us because the whole point of coming here is having an experience. And I think if most of us remembered why we came here to have the experiences we are having, uh, present situation included, by the way, uh, with, the, <laughs> with the virus, uh, I think most of us would have said, um, no, I think I'll sit on the planet beach and have a beer uh, because it, it's difficult. Even the gods have found it hard being down here. You know, when you have a physical body, it hurts no matter how developed you are. But if you understand how the processes work and how you can, you know, ride that wave uh, of conflict with stoicism and uh, uprightness and with a certain degree of control and detachment, then you're making big progress. And two, uh, one of the uh, features or benefits from what I've heard with these all these mystery religions, ancient mysteries, was you lose the fear of death. And I think when we lose the fear of death, that solves a lot of problems unconsciously, don't you think? I mean, I think most of our fears are somehow tied to the fear of death, aren't they? Exactly. It's the control of fear. It's understanding fear for what it is. It's an energy, nothing more. And it's, uh, it, it, it's, of course, fear is there for a very good reason. It's so uh, that there's the rational fear, so that when uh, a wild, rabid, grizzly bear suddenly bears down on you, you should know that you should be afraid because it um, creates a certain reaction that, well, you either uh, crawl down into a, a posture that allows you to be defensive and, you know, take your chances, or you can also stand up, uh, acknowledge that fear and raise your arms and growl like a bear at the loudest of your voice. And that usually does it actually, unless the bear's really hungry, which case it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it does mean that uh, you do realize and understand fear for what it is. You don't associate with it. And, um, if, you, if you're able to do that, and there was one moment in my uh, life when I was living here in this very quiet city in America called Portland, Maine, where nothing really much happens, thank God. And um, well, I was thinking today. about all these things. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about all of these things, and someone was saying, well, have you actually sort of practiced what you preach? I said, well, I'm not really preaching anything. I'm just giving out information and facts. I'll let people make up their own choices. But it, it did dawn on me one day when I was walking home from the cinema and mulling over a uh, some pictures that I'd just seen. And there's a guy across the street shouting at me, he's going to shoot me and he's got a gun. 
and I'm looking around for a Whoa. rock or something and there's nothing. I'm thinking, you know what? If I'm going down, I'm taking him with me. Why not? And at that <laughs> moment, I just turned around and ran towards him, which is the last thing a gunman would expect. Frighten the hell out of him. He ran the other way. And at that moment, I thought that was really stupid. And that, oh, I just realized I'm putting into practice what I just learned. You know what? I wasn't afraid for a second. I was not afraid of death. I, I, and I looked at it in the eye and I said, well, what are the, my choices? I'm going to bleed to death. I'm going to die. No, I'm going to take him with me. I'm going to make sure he has a, a good time <laughs> with me. And I'm also six foot five. So think about that when you go to the other world for a million years, you've got me to deal with. <laughs> and that was my logic. And at that moment, I realized, ah, oh, I seem to have lost all fear of death. I am no longer afraid. And I've heard this uh, said by a lot of people that have gone for the initiation itself. I haven't. And uh, they said, yes, it's losing that fear of going from one world to the next. It's a, it's a few seconds of pain before you cross over. And I remember the Templars being particularly um, affectionate to this initiation because they practiced it too. They had their secret chambers. And uh, a lot of them are documented as having gone to these funeral pyres which are smoking and there's gasoline being poured on them and uh, you know they're going to be burned alive and a lot of them sat there grim uh, you know grinning and going well a couple of moments of pain is nothing compared to what to the delights that we're going to experience shortly and then we're going to make the life of these people who've been torturing us an absolutely living hell because we can do more work from the other side so they knew they totally understood the uh, the meaning of what it was to firm, get a firm control of the sense of fear and death and pain. As far as the Gnostics, what insights did you garner from them? I mean, as many have found out, they were the heirs of these mysteries, more or less in a Christian, uh, they couched it in a, in a Christian setting. And you, uh, again, in your chapter, The Fifty Shades of Gnosticism, you break it all down from the Gospel of Philip that says, while we exist in the world, we must attain resurrection. The Gospel of Thomas, superior to the world, and so forth. But you point out, too, very interesting that in texts like the Treatise on the Resurrection and and the Great Seth, not Treatise of Resurrection, sorry, the Second Treatise of the Great Seth and the, the Writings of Basilides, Jesus was replaced by Simon of Cyrene, and then obviously we all know Islam took this. Why do you think they had that story, the Gnostics? They inherited a very precious piece of information. Uh, this would be going on for the Middle East and in the Far East for thousands of years by the time it migrates into the Near East. So by the time we have the early Christians, the Gnostics, the Essenes, the Manichaeans, uh, all of these uh, sort of dispersed groups of practitioners who were all essentially practicing the same thing. They pretty much agreed on everything, uh, just minute uh, details that they differed on. And they realized how important this information was that they were holding. And so, of course, when you have the fundamentalists that suddenly show up, and then, of course, the rise of what became the Catholic Church, who were trying to essentially create a religion from a fallen Roman Empire to gain control over the soul and the uh, politics of Europe, uh, and also the Mediterranean, they realized that they had to say something about this. They had to stand up and say, well, wait a minute, you, 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 what you're doing is you're twisting the story of a spiritual truth and you're confusing it with an actual event. So the two are very, very different things. And for this, they were all uniformly uh, murdered. I mean, there's the one thing I found very troubling about the rise of Christianity was how the fundamentalists were literally wiping out the uh, Gnostic Christian. And I thought, I'm sure they must be the same people, surely. I mean, they must be practicing the same thing. And it turns out they weren't. Uh, they recognized that the whole concept of the temple was an inner temple. Uh, it, was, it resides within you. The experience of God is not an outer experience. It's an inner experience. And when you look at the early teachings of Jesus, he said the same thing too. In fact, I'm actually amazed that it actually made it into the Bible. But it begins to uh, uh, really answer why so many of the important gospels that have so much important spiritual teaching to impart to us were left out of the original canon. And of course, now it makes a lot of sense because there was a political situation going on here uh, and it was all about control to the point where the, uh, the church tried to sell the story of Jesus to the people of the Roman world, which back then pretty much governed the whole of the Mediterranean and no one bought the story 
because he was, okay, well, he might have done some important things, but he's not a god because by then people have been accustomed to worshipping their heroes and putting them on pedestals and treating them like gods. Well, Jesus wasn't that. He was just a normal man that went through this incredible experience. And that's when they had to concoct this other story, uh, and it's very well documented. In fact, uh, Michael Bajant, the late Michael Bajant, who co-wrote Holy Blood, Holy Grail, to whom I am very indebted for his uh, research because he had information and access to sources that I don't. So I always quote him at length. And he was saying, you know, there's a lot of documentation about this, of how the whole story of Jesus was politicized and altered to go from a spiritual truth of metaphor to physical events, to the point where the whole point of the crucifixion was made up. Uh, Jesus was never crucified in the eyes of the Gnostics or the Muslims afterwards as well, or anybody in the Middle East. And they all said no. They, um, they thought that they crucified him, but they didn't. Uh, they were mistaken. They didn't have enough information. And they were confusing a spiritual truth with an event. Now, they couldn't have crucified Jesus because he had not broken any Roman law. Uh, and that's the first fundamental step into understanding this concept of crucifixion. And uh, now that we also know that there are at least 120 surviving stories around the world of initiatic societies where the initiate is metaphorically nailed to a cross after he gets up from a sarcophagus or a sacred cave or an inner temple, and the spiritualized being is metaphorically nailed to a tree of life, which represents the material world. Now we begin to understand where the two conflict with each other and how the church takes that spiritual truth that Thomas and Philip were discussing, and they basically had it confused with the real event, which was the execution of political prisoners. So this is why it was very well protected. They wanted to make sure this did not fall into the wrong hands because anyone who is able to bend the rules and bend the laws of nature can really control people in a, like a dictator, and they didn't want that to happen. They already had enough of that experience in the, the Near East at that point with the <laughs> Romans, and they didn't want the information to be sullied ever again. And it seems, Freddie, that the Gnostics might have been more loyal to the ancient Egyptians than the, the Greeks and the Romans. And let me explain why, as scholars have, have posited, and of course, give me your views. In the mystery religions, you were meant to sort of go down into the Chthonic world and die and resurrect with the god-man, uh, Dionysus, or the, the, the myth of Demeter, and so forth. But in the Gnostic mysteries, you go down to the underworld, you go down to Hades, but then you go right into the star portal and you go into this distant dimension to meet with this alien god. So you would say they, they had a, was this a feature? Is a feature, or as I'm saying, they're just more loyal to the ancient Egyptians who really believe you could just travel the universe? Oh, I think they all overlap. All the stories around the world overlap, and the more I read about them, uh, including things from Polynesia, which you'd never get to hear about, it's the same story. Uh, the characters' names change, of course, but the method is always the same. You basically go into a secret society, a uh, society set apart from the normal world, and uh, you spend a whole year under observation. You're being taught basic mysteries, and then they, you know, the teachers look at you and think, well, perhaps he or she, they... I think they can go through the process and I think we can trust them with the more important information that they're not going to leave this building and then tell anybody about it. So your second year after probation was where you went into the real nitty gritty of stuff. And then your third year was the really true mysteries where they really prepare you for this out of body journey. Uh, and you, I see that not just in Egypt, but all around the world. And the method was pretty much the same. Uh, and they always also describe the method by which they crossed into the other world, which was, you know, you're, you're, you're obviously comatose, but your soul has actually disengaged from the body. That's very different from shamanism. Uh, shamanism is a kind of an approximation of the process. And I'm sure we'll get to that later. Um, and then while your soul, and these are some of the surviving fragments of the, from the initiates, while your soul is wandering, dazed and confused, um, because you've obviously in between worlds right now, you were always given the assistance to go into the other world with uh, two black dogs. And I hear that story in the Andes, in North America, in Central America, in Egypt, in, Greek, uh, in Greece as well, and all around the world. And the idea is that these two black dogs are able to guide you while your, your soul is still groggy and unable to figure out, where the hell am I? Where, where am I going? 
And then every tradition talks about you crossing the bridge of forgetfulness over a raging river. Uh, and at that point, it's almost like they're describing the Milky Way in a certain light. And then once you're on the other side, well, if you kept your eyes, your, the, uh, obviously belonging to your soul now, not your physical body, but if you're keeping your metaphysical eyes open, you have not been seduced by all of these discarnate beings that you're seeing. Your focus is on the other side of the bridge. And then the dogs leave you alone, and you are literally in the field of reeds, uh, what we call paradisa, as the, as the uh, Persians called it, which is where we get the idea of paradise. That puts a whole new perspective on the concept of paradise. And the idea was that you went into this primordial world where everything exists simultaneously. It's very confusing. Everything's in four dimensions. So, of course, there is no up or down, left or right. And this is what you were prepared for in your last year of initiation. You had to understand on a mental level what you're going to be experiencing. And then you learn certain methods by which your soul would remember the information so that when you get over to the other side, you are not discombobulated and you know where you're going. And when you maintain that focus, you also uh, can take your consciousness where it needs to go. So let's say I want to cross over and meet with Plato and uh, hang out with a guy for a few days and find out some teachings that are important to my work. So you would learn that. You go straight to, the, uh, the, to Plato, who's now a discarnate body because he's obviously physically dead. And um, you would learn everything you need to know. And then when you come back into your living body, you'd remember every single detail. That was what was really, really important about these teachings. So wherever you were, whether it was in Egypt or Polynesia or Asia or Central America, it was exactly the same teaching. So the only reason why we keep focusing so much on Egypt is because so much of it still survives. Thanks to the Greeks, ironically, who found the teachings in pieces when they were in Egypt, and they lovingly put the temples back together again. So places like Edfu, Saqqara, um, they're often described as Greek temples. Well, they're not. The Greeks didn't build them. They rebuilt the temple, and they left the instructions of what they did in the basements of the buildings. And there's one in uh, Dendera, what uh, the Greeks wrote in the basement. We have rebuilt the temple according to the instructions as laid down the time of the first occasion, and that we were true to the word. Uh, the first occasion is dated about 10,400 BC. So you can see that the Greeks were very aware that they were following a very old tradition. And they were the, the sort of the Johnny come latelys uh, of the uh, spiritual world at the time. And even the Egyptians used to pull their leg about it. They used to say, well, wait, wait till you Greeks have been around as long as we have for about 39,000 <laughs> years, and then you'll know something. And they were pulling their leg, but uh, they were right. They had the, uh, the experience and they just gave them to anybody else that was willing to listen. Fascinating. I love this. And I love this passage where you write that the Sethians believed that the search for God was internal and not external force. Doesn't this hint to that this, we think of astral travels and all that, but it's almost like, isn't this also an inward journey? God and the universe is within us too? Oh, absolutely. And I think it comes down to our state of duality here where we, you know, and especially with uh, Western religion showing or was telling us that there's an outer and an inner and an up and down. But yes, but in the other world, that's not quite true. Uh, everything is one whole process. And that was what was very important about understanding the distinction between the teachings and religion, two very different things. And um, the idea was that whenever, whatever is simulated within you is also an, uh, an internal representation of the outer world and vice versa. So you've got to get your head around this for, uh, to begin with. Uh, to put it into bigger uh, perspective, I mean, you look at the Egyptian temples and how every temple is a mirror of the cosmos, and they described it as above, so below. So to the point where everything that is built into the temple, regardless of the, in terms of geometry or uh, measurements, or the, even the stone or the shape of the temple, is supposed to mirror a specific star or constellation that was prominent in the sky at a time when it was built. So everything about the temple looks perfect because, yes, because everything in the external world in the sky was deemed to be perfect. The wheels of the cosmos turned like clockwork. So what better example to emulate than to build a physical temple here on Earth? And the temple became a kind of mediator between you and the cosmos. And that's where the paradox begins. So when you, when you lost the plot and you say, well, I really need to get back to my spiritual self and connect with God, 
So you go to the temple because everything in the temple is a, is a representation of the body of a creative being. And the paradox is that when you go into the temple, if you put yourself in a certain state, you go within and then you go without, and yet you really are nowhere. You are in this wonderful place called the universe, uh, which has no up, no down, no left or right. Um, so in a sense, the temple becomes the mediator, a uh, mediating force between the two, the visible and the unseen. And uh, you, at the same time, when you come back from your out-of-body peregrination, you come to understand that although you've gone within, you've kind of gone without, but you also went without to come back within. So it's, it's, it's a big tongue twister in the end. But in the end, what they're trying to teach you is the fact that you really wanted to be a mirror image of everything that is around you in the cosmos. Ever thought that Alice in Wonderland is just the story of the soul going into the underworld or into the matter? Oh, yeah. It's a mystery religion in a book. <laughs> <laughs> Those writers got away with murder. They really did because, uh, I mean, look at the social convention of the period and you realize what they had to work with. And they would, you know, fr they would put these stories in such a way that it seems quite entertaining. But just like Star Wars, I mean, Star Wars is the uh, modern version of Alice in Wonderland in a matter of speaking because True. it's not about uh, Luke Skywalker. It's not about Han Solo. It's about the redemption of Darth Vader. That's the importance of the story. Here's the initiate that's got, that started off, you know, with uh, great uh, charisma and he has great potential and he's seduced by the dark side. And right at the point of death, he understands the mistake where he's gone to the other extreme and has bent him uh, to the laws of darkness. And then he goes, that was a big mistake. And right at the moment of death, he gets it. He redeems himself. And that's all you need. If you can just do that for one second in your life, even if, you, if it's at your deathbed and you understand you've left the uh, world, the physical world, a better person than when you arrived, and that's good enough. Um, you know, you're, the, you're, you're your own judge. No one's going to judge you uh, while you're here or when you, when you left. It's essentially you being a judge of your own soul and uh, estimating how well have I done here? You know, have I been pretty good? Have I, on the balance of things, have I made the world a better place? Have I become a better person than when I arrived? Those are the important things to remember. So uh, the trick is it's an individual path. So you don't beat yourself up. You do as much as you can handle. Uh, some people are lucky and they get it right uh, from the moment they leave the womb. And some people, well, it takes them the entire, you know, eight years of their life until they go, oh, I made a few mistakes. But now I understand where I went wrong. Boom, that's it. You've understood and uh, you leave, the, leave a better person. So that's essentially what it was, it was what, all about. Well said. And uh, Vance, uh, do you have a question? Is this making sense what we're talking about? Oh, yeah, it makes sense. Um, a lot of different thoughts going around. I was wondering um, if uh, the pyramid texts are so long. There's so many sayings and it's so steeped in ancient religion, symbology and culture and the gods. Is there something in our culture that is just as effective or somewhat as effective for achieving this uh, living resurrection? The only thing that I've come across that vaguely resembles it uh, in very simple form, because all of these mo uh, modern texts, as I call them, although they're about 2,000 years old, um, they're, kind of a pr they're approximations of these original texts. Uh, it really goes back to the Gnostic Gospels, and it's in fragments, it's in bits and pieces. Sometimes it's in the parables of Jesus. I mean, he always spoke in these ridiculous parables. In, uh, one of them, for example, is the story of Peter and the fish, where, uh, you know, Peter's having trouble catching fish in the Sea of Galilee. And uh, behold, Jesus shows up with the, with the guys on the shore and goes, yo, Peter, if you throw the net on the right-hand side of the boat, you'll find that your uh, fish will be plentiful. And he goes, okay. And suddenly he catches exactly 149 fish. And you wonder, now, why would throwing the net on the left-hand side of the boat gain him nothing? And this is a rowing boat, by the way. It's not exactly a yacht or a massive cruise liner. <laughs> Uh, and uh, he throws the net onto the right-hand side, and he catches exactly 149 fish. And you think, who the hell would be crazy enough to count exactly 149? And one of my uh, wonderful teachers, the late John Michel, he said, you know what? That's exactly what got my attention, because when these stories seem so ridiculous, they try to tell you something. It's a, it's a truth. And just from that one little piece of information, he went on to unravel the story about the mechanics of how the Earth works in space from that simple story. And um, the same thing also exists in the, in the Bible, for example, in the day where Jesus is having a good sleep 
someone knocks at his door at the terrible hour of like one in the morning and some woman says, you've got to come along, Lord, because uh, Lazarus has panicked. And he goes, oh, dear. So he gets out of bed, you know, uh, after a good day with the, with the lads. And um, it turns out that Lazarus was himself going for the initiation experience. Um, if you, um, I dare say this, if you, once you read my book and look at the, uh, the mysteries teachings, look at the story of Lazarus again from the, from the view of a mystic. And it makes perfect sense. He is the initiate who was buried alive in the sarcophagus and he panicked through the experience and Jesus had to go and revive him and say, okay, it's calm down, breathe, let's go for a walk. Um, <laughs> he, he panicked. Uh, and when you, because it, it never made any sense uh, as the story is written, even though it's highly uh, paraphrased, of course. But when you see it after, after reading the experiences of the initiates, Lazarus' story makes absolute sense. He's just one of these people that panicked in the middle of the whole thing. He woke up in the middle of the, uh, the experience, the out-of-body experience, and he comes back into the body, kind of like when you're having an out-of-body dream and suddenly your neighbor's car goes off and the alarm wakes you up. It's that moment where you're jolted back into the body from the other world at three in the morning and you don't know where the hell you are. You're panicking and you're sweating. And that's what happened to him as well. So... So the, the little tracks of it in the Bible, the, um, there are stories in, in Plato's works as well, where, again, he wasn't allowed to talk about his experiences. But if you look at a lot of his work and read between the lines and the metaphors, he's giving you a lot of information. And, of course, the most famous story is about the two statesmen describing this perfect environment called the island of atlantis uh, which is by the way the uh, the date that he was given is actually verified by the egyptians and the yucatec people the same date of 9600 bc which is now validated as the end of the ice age and the end of the uh, the great flood so there you go he wasn't just making this stuff up he was giving you a story and if you happen to read between the lines of what he's trying to tell you, he's trying to show you about the mysteries teachings about it. And he does it so well. He wraps the whole process of becoming more enlightened in the story between two uh, statesmen. And that's the one way that he could get away with trying to get people's curiosity pretty much in the same way that later uh, troubadours in Europe did with the stories of King Arthur uh, and the knight that's following the woman uh, who's trapped in a tower and he has to liberate her. Well, that's a story of Isis and Osiris. And it's a story of Mithra. It's a story of all of these heroes that uh, are chasing this divine bride through time and space because the divine bride was the woman who held all the information of which all the philosophers would go through this incredible experience in order to find out the true mysteries of life. So they couldn't quite say things in the manner in which they were allowed to because of the religious dictum of the time. So they had to invent these theatrical devices called myth or uh, storytelling through tr troubadours in order to get the story out to the pubs and the tavernas. And, those, and you know, a few people would say, well, wait a minute, that was a great song, but if I read between the lines, what you're telling me is, well, shh, keep quiet, because now I want you to go meet some people in the dark alley through a secret door, and they'll tell you about what I've really been talking about. And that's how they protected themselves. That's how they kept themselves from being burnt alive at the stake. So these were very important traditions that we're following here. Including hermetics, right? The philosopher's stone, <laughs> same kind of thing. Very much so. And, and, and the problem is that the, the language in which they couch this information is alien to us, even 2,000 years later. Uh, so sometimes when they're looking for the philosopher's stone, everybody's looking for a real rock. But again, it's about the metaphor. You've got to look at the metaphor and look behind the obvious, and that's how they hear the things. And it's frustrating because you want it to be kind of simple, uh, especially as we have so many other things to distract us today, like uh, television and cell phones. We haven't got time for metaphors. Uh, but if you don't do the work, um, then it, you, you really are not on the spiritual path. It requires hard work. You have to be very much part of the, um, of the process. You have to really put a certain amount of your time away every day, uh, almost like learning how to play guitar or driving a car. You have to put aside a certain time of your, of your life in order to really understand very important concepts. Uh, and that's how they did it. 
Very fascinating. And you talk about the bride and, of course, the troubadours and the Knights Templar. And uh, so I wanted to mention in your book, you talk about the Castle Tomar in Portugal. Oh, I've yes. been there, but unfortunately, the, they didn't let me down into the tunnels either, Freddie. <laughs> uh, I, I did see the symbolism and I have been to this Templar castle. <laughs> That was an interesting story. In fact, I heard from the, from the grapevine that uh, the uh, director that was responsible at the time when I was there doing research, who uh, really was, uh, I think she had a nose put out of joint because uh, I was trying to throw in some things which are, in her eyes, very metaphysical. Uh, not that she was wrong, but uh, there were a lot of blocks that suddenly came in front of me. And um, I heard that she'd been removed. Uh, I don't know whether it was because my oh, book no. became a national bestseller there, uh, as we expected it to be, because it's about the story of how the Templars created Europe's first nation state, Portugal, uh, even the Portuguese. Right, you know, very true. Uh, yeah, and it was a great story. And uh, I, I suspect that within the next five years, now that UNESCO has given the Castle of Tomar some money, and they're slowly uh, refixing up the ramparts and slowly they're digging the, uh, the vipers out of the caves. Uh, it's full of snakes. It's horrible. I hate snakes. And um, <laughs> it's like it's like... Even if, if it was available, it would be like an Indiana Jones moment where I'd be allowed to go and see the initiation chamber and I'd sit there going, snakes, why does it have to be snakes? Um, <laughs> and um, I think we'll get there because I found so much peripheral evidence. Uh, some, some of it was actually published in the local library, which is incredible. Even the director of the, uh, uh, of the Tumara um, Castle didn't even know about this. And um, it said that, yeah, back in the 40s, when the uh, war was going on in Europe and Portugal was um, essentially neutral, the, the, the workmen went around to mind fix, fixing up bits of the uh, ramparts, which are falling down. And they said quite categorically that, yeah, we uh, had to put some cement around the door um, and, and seal it off because it was falling down. And uh, it led, the passage led to uh, what looked like a, a secret chamber underneath the main rotunda. And I thought, bingo, that's all I need to know. Uh, and oh. I found other places around as well, a, a lot of the Templar uh, castles. There's one in the, the Isle of Mull, which few people know about, and that the chamber is actually still there. And you, again, you can't really go in because they, uh, they're trying to shore up the building. It's uh, fallen into decay for the last 200 years. But I managed to get hold of the plan of the building, and I know the uh, the last laird who um, owned the land, and he said, yeah, it's very interesting. That there's a chamber that's called a well, but the well sits below the sea level, which is, which and the sea goes right up to the tower, which means that the seawater would penetrate the uh, fresh water, which would be of absolutely no practical use to anyone hiding in the building if it was surrounded the well could not give you fresh water. And I thought, well, that's because it was never meant as a well. It's a metaphoric well. So one day I'll have to get in there, but uh, all, uh, by all accounts, that one is also still in there as well. I look forward to that next time I'm uh, at home in Lisbon. Hopefully you've broken some things open because, uh, yeah, the history Apparently, is there yes. and I've heard of it. I've heard <laughs> of all the legends growing up, so very cool. But uh I mentioned the bride. So you think that perhaps this means that the Valentinian, the very cryptic bridal chamber mystery was about this, the joining of opposites? Uh, yes. And I always wondered how far back that went. And it turns out that uh, at some point, someone somewhere, we don't know who, um, tried to theorize this so they could teach people who were illiterate. Uh, they came to the conclusion that the universe you know, before there was this big bang, allegedly, I don't really subscribe to that theory. I mean, big banks tend to blow things up, not create things. Um, they said, you know, in the beginning, there was just the void, but the void, God, the creator, knows everything, knew everything, will know everything. So therefore, the creator must know everything. He or she or it is completely knowledgeable. And because the uh, knowledge is expansive because the more you kn know, the more you expand. Therefore, it has to give birth. And therefore, the, the God, the central Godhead, must be female in form. And because all of this knowledge was already present before there was light and sound and matter, all this knowledge resides in the dark. And that's where you get the concept of the Black Madonna and the Black Isis. Not because they came from Africa necessarily, but because the skin color portrays the darkness before the light and the sound and the matter. It literally it signifies the void in which all the knowledge is held. So the woman, 
uh, so a metaphor, a metaphor was deemed to be the holder of the entire knowledge of the universe. And whenever the initiates were going on this quest of initiation, they said that at the very end, the idea was to marry the divine bride. And suddenly it made so much sense because here they are, they've left the body, they're traveling the other world and they're seeking this, uh, this woman, metaphorically speaking. And uh, when they finally wed her, it means that they have finally imbued, they've drank from that grail of knowledge and they have become that knowledge. And then they boom, back in the body again, and they become as a god. So this concept of the uh, black Madonnas around Europe, that's what they signify. And even in the Egyptian pantheon, you have the moment where Osiris, who of course is the classic initiate, who, by the way, is chopped up by 72 conspirators. Now, why does it take 72 people to chop up one guy, I wonder? Uh, there's a lot of information about that. It's all to do with how the earth works, by the way. It's to do with the processional cycle, but that's for another time. So he gets chopped up because in order to go to the other world and be reborn as a spiritual being, you have to destroy your original self. You can't take your body with you. You have to basically chop yourself up into bits uh, or uh, um, uh, uh, flay your, your uh, skin from your body. It's all, these are all metaphors. It just means you have to take only the likeness of yourself into the other world. You can't take physical flesh because you're going to be reconstituted as a new person when you come back. And the one thing that uh, Osiris does when he's going through the void, and he's in the spirit world, in the other world, and Isis somewhere starts saying, Sikri, which means hurry to me, my love. And basically, she's egging him on. He can't see where he's going. He's obviously in the other world. He's trying to make sense of what's going on. He only hears her voice, and she wants to marry him. She wants uh, him to mate with her, because when he does, he becomes reborn in the physical world as Horus. The one that see the falcon that sees from above, he sees the horizon. He sees the big picture of what's really going on, which of course is what is expected from the initiate. You are no longer just walking on the ground, slivering along like a serpent. You are now flying above the serpent. You're flying above the hills and the mountains, and you can see the big picture because that's what the knowledge of marrying the divine bride does for the initiate. It's a very romantic story. You mentioned Jesus being the carrier of these mysteries, but uh, I think I agree with you from the research I've done. He might have been sort of a, a rogue who went on his own, don't you think? I mean, especially when we when we study the Mandeans who aren't very keen on Jesus and the church fathers saying that uh, John the Baptist chose Dositheus and then Simon Magus. So you think Jesus went on his own and that's why things didn't work out? Oh, he was a punk. <laughs> <laughs> Disobedient trickster. He was a bro. Um, I, I do like that theory. Uh, again, if I follow the, uh, the two tracks of stories, one was from the late Michael Bajant, and the second one was from the Indian people. This is in India, by the way, not uh, Indian North America, because they're not Indians. Uh, but the Indians of India, they said, well, Jesus kind of went to Kashmir. He taught here, and he died at a ripe old age of 80. In fact, his grave is right over there. And they've never made a big deal out of it. Said he was just a normal guy like anyone. He just went through this incredible experience, uh, like many thousands of people have done. And uh, we don't make a big deal out of it. But he was a great teacher, a great avatar. In fact, the Zoroastrians claim that he was the 13th and last reincarnation of Zoroaster, who is dated to about 6,500 BC in the Indus Valley. Um, so I do think that uh, if you look at the big picture of what was going on at the time, um, G uh, it was John the Baptist was the main part of the story. He and Mary Magdalene really are the story of the initiation because uh, she is following the uh, uh, matrilineal tradition where she carries the DNA of the, the divine bloodline. And the priestesses always were the ones who maintained the integrity of the wisdom for reasons that we've already spoken about. Then you had the pillar, which was the masculine. He was the priestly messiah. He carried on the tradition. And the two of them were the, the two pillars of the temple. Now, he unfortunately has his head chopped off, which is a bit inconvenient uh, because they were in the middle of trying to put something very important together. So the next along the line is uh, Jesus's brother. And then he is unceremoniously kicked down a set of stairs. So there was a bit of an, a suggestion that he was assassinated. Well, now you have a bit of a problem because Jesus is sitting there. He's doing his work and he thinks, ah, we have the Romans encroaching and we have the, um, the Hebrew teachers who have become very corrupt and 
I'm running out of time. I can't, I can't get the sense that Jesus was actually very <laughs> impatient, you know. And um, he said, you know, now I, we've lost the, uh, the, the bloodline. Mary's gone underground. We can't talk about her at all. Uh, I've also made the pregnant, which means we've really got to make sure that she stays underground. Uh, John's gone. My brother's gone. So it means, ah, I've got to take on both pillars. I've got to be the kingly Messiah and the priestly Messiah. Because at that moment, if you look at uh, what's written uh, or survives in the Bible, he is in a hurry to indoctrinate everyone, left, right, and center. He was administering the uh, resurrection story in every single village square he could speak at. And that's where the Essenes and the Mandeans castigated him. And I thought, what a wonderful thing here. And if you pay very careful attention to the story, it's because they said to him, you can't do this in shortcuts, okay? You have to go through the process. It doesn't matter what the political moment uh, is. It doesn't matter what pressure you're in. You, there is no shortcut to the living resurrection. You have to go through the process. And to, the, um, to this very day, the Mandeans have never forgiven Jesus for indoctrinating everybody left, right, and center into the mysteries without the proper um, process. It, it's almost like learning how to drive after one lesson. It, unless you're a genius, it just doesn't happen. You're about to have an accident sooner or later. And uh, they, they haven't forgiven them to this very day. And I'm thinking 2,000 years is a long time to carry a grudge. They must be telling the truth uh, <laughs> because they actually followed the mysteries of John the Baptist to this very day. Uh, the one book that the church says never was written. And, of course, they, they, all they do is say, well, it makes this book very inconvenient then, doesn't it? So I think that's what was happening from my reading of the situation, that he found himself at a crossroads here where he was uh, impatiently trying to create a new change, a, a new order, a, a new age. And he could see that the odds were going against him. And the only way he could do it was by getting as many, excuse me, as many disciples as possible. And, uh, of course, that really undermined the uh, process that had been set up for thousands of years. And that's why even the Essenes said, sayonara, we're out of here. We don't want anything to do with you anymore. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it wasn't because he was a bad person. He, he was on a personal mission. And then after that, if you follow the trajectory of the independent researchers, he, um, the, he was with Mary Magdalene. They had children. And this, if you have a, a, something that important and you like having a bank account and there's a recession coming, you don't put all your money in one bank account. You split it up. You save the day. So she, of course, goes off to um, Marseille, uh, lands in the south of France, and then goes oh, AWOL, disappears. Uh, I suspect that some of her children actually ended up in Portugal. And... Um, Jesus, of course, went off to, uh, to the east, to India. And I suspect that some of the, uh, the kids ended up in Portugal because I was asking the same question when I was uh, following the Templar story from my, my fourth book. And um, it wasn't really part of the trajectory of the book. I just happened to come across something that sparked my interest. And I asked some leading Freemasons uh, who were part of the Essene tradition, by the way, um, there are two tracks of Freemasonry. One's the London Rite, which is basically a boys' club, uh, which knows nothing of what they're doing. And then you have the Scottish Rite, who are following the very ancient uh, tradition of initiation. Uh, and they understand that, by the way. So if you ever want to follow the modern tradition of initiation, Scottish Rite is where you should go. So I asked them about this in Portugal, and uh, this, the, what I got back was, well... I think your nose has got too close to the honeypot. I would drop the story if I were you. And I thought, okay, I'll take that as a yes, that uh, the bloodline does survive in Portugal somewhere. Um, I'll let someone pick up the thread for, of that story uh, because it, uh, it's going to require a lot more years of research. But, uh, I, and I suspect that something this important would probably will not be revealed until the right political moment. Oh, indeed. And uh, Freddie, as we get towards the end of the interview, you mentioned at the beginning to talk about uh, shamanism and how it ties us all together or the missing part of it. Do you want to answer that now? Yeah, wow, well, one now already. That was quick. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, that was the big question when I was finishing the book. How does shamanism and the ayahuasca and all that tie into it? And I've asked a lot of people who I respect in Central and South America about this. And the uh, unanimous uh, story that I get back from them is that, well, these are, these are fun things to do, you know, but you can't be a weekend shaman and uh, practice ayahuasca for a week and then expect this to be the exact experience of the soul going into the other world and back and learning the mysteries of initiation. It's an approximation because what you're doing here, you're using a drug to generate a certain chemical imbalance in the brain, which acts as a kind of a translator between you 
your logical self and what's going on in the other world. Uh, that's not really what's happening. The true initiation is actually having a near-death experience and leaving the body physically and being there. Two very different things. However, they said, if you are following the shamanic tradition and you do this for many, many years, as some of our practitioners do, then you start relying less on the chemical and you're relying more on your own ability uh, and your own mechanisms to go out of body. That's true shamanism. You can't do this for a weekend or a month. You need years out of your life, uh, which is something that few people in the world can do in this day and age. Uh, and I thought that was a very lucid explanation. It does explain why they take this seriously, but uh, this uh, concept of going away to the Yucatan or Guatemala to have you know, two weeks of vomiting, <laughs> just to see uh, snakes and uh, go on a vision quest. Uh, it's fun, but it gives you an idea of what was going on. It's almost like the troubadours of Europe. They will give you a little taste of what, was, uh, what you could do if you had the time and the devotion to do it, but it wasn't really the real thing. It's the difference between filet mignon and a Big Mac. You know? uh, they both satisfy you for, uh, for, for a few minutes, but a filet mignon would stay with you for at least a month. You'll remember that experience. Well said. And you, there's no uh, mystery religion to take away your fear of snakes, or you've just resigned yourself in this world. At this oh, point. God, I've tried everything. Uh, I suspect <laughs> that I may have fallen into a vat of asps in Egypt or somewhere. Um, my mother was <laughs> pregnant when um, she was eight months pregnant when she picked up what she thought was a brightly colored stick in Portugal and it wrapped around her arm. It may just be a, a genetic shock. Uh, my God, it's hard to get rid of. Uh, although having said that, I was in the Templar Castle in Portugal with a group of people uh, leading one of my little personal tours. And uh, I just said, okay, these are the secrets of the initiation. There's a well down there. Um, if you want to go down there, you can, but it's dangerous. It's full of snakes. And be careful of the vipers because they blend in into the, um, the granite. And I walked 10 feet. I nearly stepped on one <laughs> and it raised itself up to my knee. <laughs> oh my up, God. And it said, He's big. And he fell backwards and he just slid it away. And I don't remember what happened, except people were trying to sna uh, you know, smack me and think, you know what? You just lost your suntan in about one second. And <laughs> you let out a very large yelp and you just froze in me there. <laughs> but the snake's gone. I thought, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, no, it's just one of those things, I guess. I just got to learn to live with it. Yeah, we all have our, our kismet and uh, our to deal with but uh, yes we are at the end of this fascinating interview for the listener freddie's book covers not just europe and the middle east he goes uh, to mesoamerica to asia australia the aborigines so it's the whole package of this art of resurrection that is still around but we are at the end first i'd like to say vance thanks for keeping us company my pleasure uh, to be here and listening to basically what i think is the goal of gnosis Exactly. There you go. Well said. Freddie, well, thank you very much for coming on Aeon by Gnostic Radio. And we really enjoyed your book, The Lost Art of Resurrection. And we look forward to your future research and all the insights you bring to the world. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to share this with uh, a new audience. And there you have it, my beloved true seekers. The brilliant Freddie Silva on his book, The Lost Art of Resurrection. I hope you're convinced that this art and that mystery school vibe is a key way to navigate this age of Hermes and Philip K. Dick world. As mentioned in the intro, you get the full interview as we only did an hour because of issues Freddie was having and overall scheduling issues. So as a bonus, we are honored to also have my friend and brilliant scholar, Joanna Kuyawa, for patrons and AV Prime members. She'll complement what Freddie doesn't fully cover, even in his book, specifically the rich and mercurial tradition of the dying and rising goddess, chthonic deities like Inanna, Isis, Ishtar, and more, including some heavy doses of Sophia and Mary Magdalene. Don't miss it, and don't miss more Pleromic content coming soon that includes shows on Prometheus, Transhumanism, Free Will, NLP, and more, with high-level and controversial astral guests, many interviews you won't find anywhere else in cyberspace or even meat space. 
Become an AB Prime member or Patreon at Patreon for complete shows and so many incredible bonuses to build a thriving Gnostic community and resurrect yourself into the best version of yourself. Finding Hermes is out and we're ready to gather as a community to get out of so many mazes. A new podcast will be out soon on Finding Hermes. If you find value in anything I've mentioned, please support as I lay all my cards down in 2020 to give you the wisdom of the Gnostics you also won't find anywhere else in cyberspace or meat space. Don't forget the merch store is live as well as my voiceover services. This is the age of Hermes. You were made for this. You were made to hold on to the golden thread of Sophia and get out of all insanity around. You were made to resurrect. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being yourself, your true self, even briefly, here in the desert of the real. Hello and goodbye, as always.